Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. You're all very welcome to worship here at Whitehead Presbyterian today. My name is Adam Cree, and I'm the ministry coordinator here. If you're a visitor or it's your first time with us, please feel free to stay behind after the service and have tea and coffee. Get to know us a little bit, introduce yourself. It would be an absolute joy and pleasure to do so. Before we come to worship this morning, um, I do have a couple of announcements, but before we get there, turn around, greet each other, welcome each other, wish each other a good morning. Good morning. So only a, a few announcements this morning. Um, first, and um, probably of foremost importance, um, we will be continuing our prayer meetings. As I said last week, we began meeting at the start of summer on a Saturday morning from 9 a.m. here in the main church sanctuary for prayer. And it has been an absolutely incredible time. I'm sure you're starting to think, Adam, will you stop telling us about this every single week? But I seriously can't, I really can't stop telling you or encouraging you anymore. We've had up to 20 people out at our prayer meetings. Now, to put that in context, there's about 60 of us meet here on a Sunday morning, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little less. But that's a third of our congregation coming out every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. to pray. And this time of prayer has been solely focused on our community, on our congregation, on our growth, on our future, on putting the first thing first, which is Jesus at the center of everything we are and do. And boy, have we been blessed. Honestly, completely blessed. Prayers answered for individuals, prayers answered as a congregation. And I just want to see more. I want more and more of us seeing the importance of this foundation. You know, as a growing church, as I keep referring to in my own head, not a small church, but a young church refinding their feet, prayer is the foundation of everything we do. So let me encourage you, if you're yet, to make your way out on Saturday morning. Don't worry, nobody's gonna force you to pray out loud. You can sit and take part silently, but please think about making it a part of your week. It has been such a blessing to everyone involved. So that's prayer is continuing. We said it was gonna go until the end of August. We're gonna continue going um, indefinitely with prayer Saturday morning here in church at 9 a.m. Please come along. Um, next point, the first committee meeting of the new season will be being held on Wednesday the 13th of September in the Bradley Room at 7.30 p.m. So again, that's our first committee meeting of the season, Wednesday the 13th of September, Bradley Room at 7.30 p.m. And then last, we have our Common Ground event, an event I've been sharing with you over the last two or three weeks. Um, hopefully this morning, as you'll be aware, this is a, a women's event and hopefully if you are a woman, you have received a leaflet about the ladies and girls events being held between ourselves, Bally Carey and Island McGee Presbyterian. And as I've said, this is under the name of Common Ground. Um, this morning there are sign-up sheets out in the vestibule for those wanting to attend the Mums and Tots morning in Bally Carey, for those wishing to attend the ladies evening in Island McGee, both of those being held on the 16th of September. Um, and then there'll be further information regarding our young um, girls event um, in the coming weeks that will be being held here in Whitehead Presbyterian Church. And um, it's with great sadness that I announce to you that unfortunately the Reverend Nathan Duddy will be here next week and set myself, so apologies for that. But I'm sure he'll be very blessed by his presence back with us again. Um, I love Nathan dearly, so probably that is a tongue in cheek joke. Um, but obviously, we come to worship here this morning. Um, as the words of Psalm 113 tell us, we come to praise the Lord, praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. Praise, praise, that is why we arrive here this morning. Setting aside self, coming to give the Lord all the glory to seek his face and to thank him for all his goodness in our lives this morning is about Jesus, about making him the center point of our lives, of everything we are and do. This is a time of worship. Before we come to sing together, let us open up in prayer. <coughs> 
Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Holy Spirit, breathe upon us, fall afresh on us here as we seek to lift the name of Jesus high over our lives, high over this congregation and high over this town. We love you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us in whatever way we serve you this morning, be it in your word, be it in singing of song, be it in welcome, tea and coffee, audio visual, Lord, help it all to be a sweet smelling aroma, an offering to you, an offering of thanks. I thank you for every way you have blessed us in the heavenly realms. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us now come, stand together as we praise God, singing greater than it all. Let's stand together and sing.
continue to serve and praise the Lord as we receive our offer. Let us pray and give thanks. Glorious Father, Lord God, we offer you our gifts, dedicating them to your service in the building up of your kingdom here on earth. With them, Lord, we dedicate and commit ourselves to planting kingdom seeds as we seek to glorify you to proclaim the name of Jesus through the power and might of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we lay these gifts at your feet now in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Let us all stand together once again as we praise God singing, Purify My Heart. Let us stand together and sing.
Let us now pray together as we pray for the world around us, for others, for our community. And this morning, especially, I want to take some time to pray for students and teachers as we enter a new school academic year. I want to take some time to thank God and pray for our teachers, our students, and everybody else uh, connected to education in our community. So let's bow our heads in prayer together. Almighty God, we thank you for the blessing, Lord, for the command to pray for others, for the world around us and the church. Lord God, you are present with your people everywhere. We pray for those we love who are far away. Lord, we ask that you watch over them and protect them. Lord, keep far from them all that would hurt the body and harm the soul. Give them and us the assurance of strength and peace of your presence. And keep us all so near to you that we will forever be near to one another. And also, Lord, in your good time, may we renew our fellowship together with those so far and at the last, come together to the unbroken fellowship of the Father's house in heaven. God of truth and love, you are true wisdom embodied. You have commanded us to love you with all our mind. And as such, we think of all of those returning to schools, colleges, whether teachers and students, whether caretakers and groundskeepers. We pray that you bless the work of schools, colleges and universities, that in them the truth may never be denied, betrayed, concealed, but that it would be honored, followed and obeyed. Lord, we pray that you would guide teachers and students by the power of your Holy Spirit in their endeavors to seek and to serve truth. May their learning never cut them off from the community, but lead them towards enlarged and selfless service. Grant that learning may also flourish among us as a means for both enriching our lives and of the drawing us nearer to you, from whom all truth proceeds. Lord, we specifically lift up to you Whitehead Primary School, and those other schools close to our community. We pray for all those within our congregation who work there, who have previously worked there or in other education. Lord, we thank you for the faithful foundations that they have laid, that they continue to lay in the lives of children and young adults. Lord, we pray that you bless them, keep them, Lord, we present these prayers to you in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So this morning, once again, as we have been doing over the last number of weeks, we've been inviting a number of people up to share with us, to share testimony, um, to share experience. Um, and namely, this has came out of a number of the members of our congregation going along to New Wine in Sligo. And they had a really blessed time and really experienced the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through them during that time. So this morning, um, following on from Alec, who so kindly shared with us last week, I've invited Helen Graham to share with us this morning. Um, and really what this is, yet again, is not a time for people to share how good God is being in their life, but to encourage you that God is at work within our community within our congregation, within our church body. God is at work, the Holy Spirit is moving. Amazing things are happening. So this is an encouragement. This is not a look how great certain people are. This is to inspire you to see where God is working in your life. Because let me encourage you, he is working in your life. You may not just be able to see it yet. So let me invite and thank Helen up to share with us uh, this morning. Thank you, Helen. As Adam has said, a number of us have really 
enjoyed going to Sligo, going to New Wine and Sligo over a number of years. And uh, each time we come away with real blessing from God. And I just wanted to share with you this morning a little bit of what happened uh, from my perspective. Um, last week, Alec gave an overview of the conference and really the, the setup of it is very simple. In the morning, we have a, a, teach, a Bible teacher, or, a, or this year it was a couple who were leading in the Bible teaching. And then after tea or coffee, we go to seminars. There are some seminars in the afternoon and then in the evening we have a, a celebration evening and again there's uh, worship and teaching at that. So what I want to home in on this morning is really one of the seminars that I went to. And I think as Alec was saying last week, uh, it was definitely in God's hands that we got to this seminar because um, you have to you have to choose uh, which seminar you want to go to and Lorna, Lex and I had chosen to go to one which was on prophecy and Alec had chosen to go to one which was on the Asprey outpouring, Asprey being a time in America um, and this is something that had happened a number of months previously but just to say whenever we got to the seminar that we wanted to go to, um, it was full, so we were turned away. And we ended up going to the same uh, seminar as Alec was at, the one to do with the Asprey outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. So definitely that was in God's hands that we got there in the first place. So just to say that the person who was speaking was a gentleman called David Legg, and David and his son happened to be in America at the time of this outpouring. He works for a Christian organization, which I can't remember the name of, but uh, he and his son were about 100 miles from Asbury. And they decided that they would go this afternoon and find out what was happening there. And he was able to bring back some um, footage on his phone that he had taken. So we did get uh, an idea of what was happening. Now, this may sound a bit strange to you, but it's really, I suppose, what we would have called uh, in the past revival or something to that description. But um, what happened was there were students meeting in the Methodist College in Asprey, and they were meeting for a service of worship, and there, um, church was probably a bit, well they would call it a chapel I think in the, in the Methodist College, but it was a bit, bit bigger than our church here and up on the stage we saw a piano and somebody playing the guitar and they were singing music. So anyway, to get back to how it started, um, there were, after the service of worship, there were four students who remained and these students just were sharing with each other and one of them confessed something that he had done to the other students and this very act of confession seemed to change the atmosphere in this building and it was as if God was really present in an amazing way in the building and some of the other students came in and they uh, were aware of it as well, and then more and more students came in, and they really felt the presence of God. They felt the presence of God's Holy Spirit mm. so tangibly in that um, uh, chapel uh, in Asbury. And this seemed to go on and on, and they stayed, and they worshiped, and they prayed, and they, talked with one another and just just were absorbing this um, this presence of God. And the people started coming from all over America to this because they had heard about it. The media took it up and the media and um, the people from the, the media in an amazing way spoke positively about it, which isn't always the way in CBN news in America. And more and more people came. And some people who were um, 
I, th I think they were probably well-known uh, praise bands in America. They offered to do a set of praise on an evening or something like that. But it was said, no, we want to keep it simple. We just want this to be centered on Jesus. We don't want any big names involved in it. And, um, and so it was, that was the way it was run. And they, even the, the people in charge of the college, they didn't want to come in and take control. They wanted it, it to be student-led. And, and so it was. And uh, as I say, everything was kept simple, kept centered on Jesus and this awareness of God's presence. And after about 10 days, um, they decided that they would finish it at that, and after that, 10, after that 10 days. So this gentleman, David Lai, was sharing this with us. And he was saying that really, Jesus was at the center of it all and nothing else was um, imposing on that. And the thing that really impressed me was that it started with confession. And confession is maybe something that we don't really have as a, you know, a major part of our denomination, but it is so important. And I think this was something that I found that night when we went back to the house that we were staying in. We were just having a conversation after the evening celebration. And I find myself being very unkind um, about somebody, not somebody in our church here, um, but I, was, I just was really convicted by God that I had really spoken out of turn about this person. I really felt God saying to me, Helen, you need to confess this. You need to just ask my forgiveness. This, this, just this little voice in my head. And um, at that point, I, I just said to, I think it was Lex and Alec here, or their one who was um, in her bedroom, I think. And um, I said, I really feel I need to confess this. It, it was wrong of me to speak like that. And, uh, and so that's, that's what I did. I, I prayed and asked for God's forgiveness. And the interesting thing was, whenever the Sunday that we came back to church, um, Alan's preaching was on the power of the tongue, which I thought was quite relevant to, <laughs> to what I had been convicted of. And uh, he was speaking about that with our tongues, we can speak life words over people or we can speak death words over people. So there's a real power in our tongues, and once you have spoken something, you can't take it back. So that really uh, resonated with me, and I think it's something that we all need to uh, think about. First of all, that we keep short accounts with God, so confession is really important. If we feel ourselves saying something or doing something that we know isn't right, then just there and then stop and confess it to God. And just also to ask God to guard our tongues. You know, it's, it's so easy to say something, and as I said, very difficult to take it back. So those are things that I learned at uh, New Wine this year. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Helen, thank you. Um, so, also thank you so much for your vulnerability there and be able to share your confession. I think that is a huge, a huge thing to stand up in front of the whole church as um, and, and be able to say, look, here's something I've struggled with. Um, here's, here's what I did with that or what I felt the Lord encouraging me to do. So thank you so much for that, Helen. I really do appreciate that. Um, but we come to this morning's reading. We're going to be looking at some of the, the topics that Helen touched on there in, in, a, in a sort of roundabout way. But hopefully by the end of, of this morning's sermon, you will get a feel for the angle that um, I'm coming up with this. So this morning we will be reading from Psalm 115. So hopefully you have your Bibles with you or have access to one. It's always a great idea to bring your Bible to church, by the way. It's probably the most perfect place to have a Bible, if I'm honest. So please bring your Bibles along with you. But while you make your way to Psalm 115, today we wrap up our summer series in the Psalms. Um, we've looked at many topics and characteristics of God from the Psalms, we've looked at hope, dependence, refuge, 
Taming the tongue, as Helen said. Seeing God in creation and many, many more things. And my real hope for this series over these summer months was to drill down into some of the numerous characteristics of God that we find within the Psalms. Discovering how we relate to these characteristics, interact with them and understand them in their proper intended meanings. So today, as we finish up our series in the Psalms, we look to Psalm 115, reading from verse 1. Again, that's Psalm 115, beginning at verse 1. This is the Word of God. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory, because of your love and faithfulness. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. But their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk, nor can they utter sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. All you Israelites trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. House of Aaron trusts in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. The Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless his people Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great alike. May the Lord cause you to flourish, both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth, the earth he has given to mankind. For it is not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down to the place of silence. It is we who extol the Lord, both now and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Amen. So Psalm 115 is a special psalm, especially within the Jewish community. It's part of a far broader story to them than just being the 115th psalm. You see, Psalms 113 through to 118 make up what is known as the Hallel. The Hallel, Hebrew meaning praise. And this is a specific Jewish prayer. Either a word-for-word -word recital of Psalms 113 to 118 or sung as a hymn. And this specific hymn was and still is sung within the Jewish calendar on Jewish holidays. It's a prayer or a hymn of praise, a prayer or a hymn of thanksgiving to the Lord. <coughs> and on all the days where the Halal, Psalms 113 to 118, are recited, this psalm, Psalm 115, is recited in its entirety, except on two holidays. On Rosh Chodesh, and within the last six days of Passover, when only verses 1 to 11 of Psalm 115 are recited. And this is really interesting for us, because if we jump forward to Matthew 26 to verse 30, we find an often overlooked verse right in the middle of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 26 verse 30 tells us when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And if you have your Bible in front of you, you should be able to answer this. But when exactly was it that they sung this hymn? When they had sung this hymn together, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Does anybody know what event, what occasion, what holiday this was? Anyone? Passover. Oh, you want to wreck the light here? Sorry. Don't <coughs> break stuff, Adam. Yeah, Passover. It was on Passover. This was right after Jesus and his disciples had ate their Passover meal together. 
When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And the Halal, including the first 11 verses of Psalm 115, was exactly what they would have sung. Because this was the way. On Passover, they recited Psalms 113 to 118, including the first 11 verses of Psalm 115. Lots of numbers there. But what's important here is that Jesus sang this psalm many, many times. Now, when we think about that for a second, Jesus, right before he made his way to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he would pray, let this cup pass from my lips, yet not my will but yours be done, where our Savior sweat drops of blood in anguish and fear, knowing what lay before him over the coming 24 hours. Right before Jesus peaceably handed himself over to the temple guard. This was the last hymn he sang with his disciples. All that pain, suffering, and isolation set before him. Yet he sang not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. It sets the whole thing in a different light when we read it knowing that. When we read the psalm knowing the story, knowing our Lord and Saviour sang these very words and when he sang them. Even more, it's astonishing how similar these words are to his prayer in Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours be done. And all of this got me thinking, including the story that Helen shared with us this morning got me thinking about the students in the Asbury Revival, and then in turn about us as a church, about our own personal walks as Christians, about Jesus. You see, all of the attributes, the healthy habits that we have looked at within the Psalms over the summer, I realize that really they matter very little. They matter very little, hoping in the Lord, taking refuge in the Lord, taming our tongue, not prioritizing material worth. None of that really matters. If its central purpose isn't to bring glory to the name of Jesus. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. You see, even all of these acts can be pride-fueled actions. All of it can be purely pride-fueled. And that's a struggle, it's a challenge, because one of the primary motives of our flesh is self. The enemy tells us to look out for number one. The world tells us, be who you want to be. Do what you want to do. Be your own person. Pride. The world screams at us. Advertising, social media, news, it screams to me, be the glory, me, mine, I, pride. And even more, this is a hot topic in our wee country because we tend to get pride all wrong. Because we're big on humility, but we're bad at understanding what pride really is and really isn't. When we say, to God be the glory, what's that mean for us? You see, we often think that pride is thinking too highly of ourselves. We look at somebody else, we think, oh, that big lad there, he's a bit haughty, isn't he? He needs to be brought down a peg or two. Thinks a bit much of himself, him. We think that pride is the blowing up of oneself. And we think we're really good at humility. We do a great job of casting off every compliment, playing ourselves down, minimizing our contributions. We do a great job of making sure that we don't get the attention. But can I just suggest really gently that thinking less of yourself is no less prideful than to think too fondly of yourself. Thinking less of yourself is no less prideful than thinking too fondly of yourself. 
That's a challenge to every way we think. You see, pride isn't about how great or how little you think you are. Let me maybe say that a better way. Humility isn't thinking less of yourself. Humility, rather, is thinking of yourself less. Humility isn't thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Regardless of whether your struggle is with images of grandeur or, or feelings of inadequacy, both are pride. Both are pride because the soul focuses on how you're perceived, how the world sees you. Oh, I don't want to seem too prideful. That's still pride, isn't it? So you're trying to portray yourself in a certain way. It's thinking about us. You know, humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking about yourself less. Let that sink in for a second. But why does this all matter anyway? Well, as we see with Psalm 115, again, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. You see, this life, the life of a disciple of Jesus, is a life wholly committed to pointing to another. And pride is this messy bit of our flesh that continually gets in the way. It distracts us, steals from us that voice in our heads that makes us think it's all about us. That voice is the one that steals the glory from God. That voice that tells you it's about you. Whether they're positive thoughts, negative thoughts, it doesn't matter because it's not. It's not about you and I. This is not about you and I. None of this is about you and I. It isn't about my preferences, my likes, my dislikes. And that is freeing. When we can cast off pride, knowing that this isn't about me. I'm not placed here now in this place for me. I'm not placed here and now for my desire for the style of music the competency of the choir or band, the clothes you wear or I wear, because this life isn't about us. It's about none of that. And just like those students in Asbury, they didn't want famous Christian worship leaders, speakers or the likes to come in and take over. Why? Well, it wasn't their own pride. It wasn't their own secrecy. It was because they wanted to keep the main thing, the main thing. This is about Jesus, not for our glory, but to yours, King Jesus, to you be the glory. It's all about Jesus, and pride has no place in that relationship. It can't function. It can't be about us. Because we meet here for one reason and one reason only to praise the Lord in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's why we're here to live a life of worship. So, what must we do about this battle with pride? Do we all have it? It creeps into all of our lives in varying ways. So, what do we do? Well, we skip forward. We skip forward to verse 11 of Psalm 115. Verse 11 tells us quite simply, you who fear him, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. This last, this last verse of Psalm 115, well, it's not the last verse, but it would have been the last verse that Jesus would have sang that night of Passover. You who fear him, trust in the Lord. You see, this is what must replace our pride. And hear me out here. A healthy, holy, reverent fear of the Lord. A way of thinking that makes God way, way bigger than any of you and your stuff. 
your likes, your dislikes. Fear? Really, Alan? Why? Because you simply can't have a big enough vision or perspective of who God really is without a healthy fear for his sheer power and majesty, his holiness and splendor. Remember Proverbs 9 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Too often we are uncomfortable with this idea of fearing the Lord. Our human perspective streams, he struggles to marry this idea of fearing our all-loving Heavenly Father. Yet the funny thing is, is that many of us as a child, and mom, you can close your ears for a second. Many of us as a child with parents or guardians that loved us, yet we carried a healthy fear. We know that feeling of being loved, but of having a healthy fear, like mom's gonna hate me for that. I remember thinking that all too often. All kids, nearly all of us, at some point have lived with this healthy perspective of fear. It's just that as adults, we let pride get in the way. We grow up and think, well, I don't deserve to be treated like that anymore. I'm a big boy or girl, and I can do what I want, how I want. And we try to object this idea of love and fear, commingling. Pride comes in. It tells us again, you can do it yourself, you're fine, do what you want. But fear of the Lord brings us back to that healthy, reverent understanding that we worship the maker of the universe, the author of time and space, of all matter, energy, substance. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And trust me, fear and wisdom will quickly highlight your struggle with pride whatever form that pride takes in your life. Now let me be really clear for one second. There is a difference between fear and afraid. Afraid is a different emotion to this holy, reverent fear. For example, we may be afraid of the dark because we're unsure of what can happen. We can't control the dark. That's afraid. Afraid of not being in control, not being safe. That is afraid. But fear of the Lord is completely different. Because we have a perfect, loving God. We are safe in his hands. It's not like the dark. It's not afraid of the Lord. It's a holy, reverent fear. And we are safe in his hands. You can trust him. His plans are good. Afraid is about safety and control. The fear of the Lord is about surrender. Surrendering to an all-loving God, an all-powerful God, perfect in every way. And we are called to hold him in a place of such magnitude in our hearts and minds that everything else peels in significance. That is fear. Grasping and understanding the sheer magnitude, the magnitude of our Lord, and allowing the pride of our hearts to melt away like wax in the light of His love, grace, mercy, in the light of His majesty. The fear of the Lord is not afraid, it's about surrender. Surrendering to a perfectly loving, all-powerful King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Surrendering your everything to the Father through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the end of pride and the beginning of wisdom. So my heart for you today is don't run from this idea of fearing the Lord. We tiptoe around it and we try to make excuses for it and reasons why. One of the problems is we conflate our imperfect earthly relationships and ideas of fear with the relationship we have with the Father through Jesus Christ. 
Allow that fear, that awe and wonder of his sheer majesty to shape you, to form you, to lead you to place, to a place where pride of self is peeled away. Secondly, realize where you carry your pride, because we all have. It might not look like conventional pride, it might be hiding underneath, a, underneath a, a weight of insignificance. And remember that humility isn't thinking less of yourself, but rather thinking of yourself less. And the reality is, as your perspective grows, as your vision of God's sheer beauty and majesty increases, that healthy, reverent fear will grow too. And that is the most freeing experience you can have. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for scripture. Lord, we thank you for what a blessing it is to freely own and possess a Bible. Unafraid. We thank you for the wisdom it contains. Lord, we thank you for how you bless us with it every day. And Lord, this week, moving forward in our walks with you, Lord, highlight those areas of pride, whether it's thoughts of grandeur or whether it's fears of insignificance. Lord, replace all of that with a healthy, holy fear for your beauty, majesty, your love, grace and mercy. Replace that pride with a desire for more of Jesus and less of us. Increase in us, Lord. Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us. We thank you for your word. Bless us now as we continue to worship you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Let me just invite the choir back up again. Before we close with the benediction this morning, we're going to stand together singing, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. Let us stand together and sing. Thank you.
share the benediction together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.